welcome to Access Ideas. This is Yana, and today I'm speaking with someone who you've likely heard in commercials representing your favorite brands, including Dell, HGTV, Nespresso, and Kraft. Her voice has been described as warm, friendly, and comforting with a hint of gravitas. And that's not all she's known for. On her podcast, Audio Branding, Jody Krangle and her guests offer advice on making an impact with sound and share insights on how sound influences us, both in our buying decisions and our daily lives. Audio Branding was recently nominated for a Sovis Award, which is like the Oscars of the voiceover community. Jody understands the power of sound, and I think you'll enjoy her range of perspectives in our conversation. We touch on topics like how sound can influence how we perceive taste and the significance of audio branding in products we use every day. We also take a closer look at opportunities for using Clubhouse, an audio-based social media app that allows you to host and join audio conversations. And now I bring you Jody Krangle. Jody, welcome to Access Ideas. It is great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And great to have a fellow Canadian and Ontarian mm. at that on the podcast. Where are you joining us from today? I am in a little place called Newmarket. So it's around uh, 40 minutes up the highway from Toronto. Great. I know it well. That's without traffic, yes. as you well know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to ask you a question you are very familiar with, and that is something that you ask all of your guests. What is an early memory of sound that moved you, Jody? Oh, my goodness. Okay, you're catching me in my own <laughs> interesting little conversation there. Um, okay, uh, you know, I grew up with parents who were very musical, and one of our very first memories with sound was that my parents would have sing-along time with my sister and I, not um, not story time. So my dad plays guitar, my mom sings, and uh, my dad also plays piano, but that was a little harder to bring to the bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so guitar it was. And it was really a wonderful family memory that I have with myself and my sister and my parents and the dogs and, you know... Yeah, that that's kind of, I mean, I appreciated sound from a very early age. I remember listening to the radio to go to bed. That used to be my thing. I, I had to have the radio on before I would be able to sleep. And I was listening to a radio station here in Toronto called CKEY. I don't know if you remember 590 CKEY. It's old, 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 old. <laughs> and uh, they were playing like oldies. Like I remember listening to Nat King Cole on that, right? <laughs> No and here I am, like, I don't know, this must have been like the, I don't know, the late 70s, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah. Well, I used to work at Sears Outlet and they played oldies nonstop. So the 60s and 70s sounds are well within my soul now. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, my parents definitely raised us on the 70s stuff. Yeah. So, nice. you know, Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder, Joni Mitchell... James Taylor, you know, all of that. Oh, yeah. That stuff. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and on a personal note, I understand you actually compose music. You have a Filker background. Maybe explain <laughs> what that is. Well, Filk is the music of science fiction fantasy fandom. So it happens at science fiction fantasy conventions. And a lot of times there are rooms set aside for people to just sit in a circle and play music with one another, kind of like campfires. And uh, it's really a, a lot of fun. I have enjoyed it for a good many years. I think the first time I was introduced to it was 1994. <laughs> so wow. uh, it's been a while. And you started that then before the audio branding and the voiceover. Oh, yeah. Long wow. before. It. Yeah. Wow. That's great. How do you feel that a musical background serves your voiceover acting or work? You know, I think that there are backgrounds for voiceover that work in various different Industries. So I know people that come at this from radio who have really good improv backgrounds, people who have acting chops, and this is acting. They don't call it voice acting for nothing. So you need to have some kind of acting ability to connect with what you're saying. And, uh, you know, there are people from all sorts of walks of life, entertainers, 
uh, creators, coaches, people who were in education, know how to relay information in a way that sounds interesting. For a musician, I kind of feel like I hear the notes and beats of a script so that it doesn't become sing-songy necessarily, but it's never boring. Not monotone. And I think that that is, yeah, and it, feeling the musicality of a script in a way, I think, is a very unique approach, but I think it's one that works well, along with being taught how to act. Because I started from a musician's point of view, but then I really needed to have the actor's perspective as well, because you can't just sound beautiful. You need to be able to connect with what you're saying yeah. so that it actually connects with the people listening. Well, and one of the themes that comes up on your show frequently is this idea of speaking to an audience or having an audience in mind when you're speaking, when you're pre whether you're presenting or performing voiceover work. And that, of course, relates to the idea of the musician and the audience and understanding that there's a connection that's deeper than just information. It's an emotional connection and resonance. Very much so, yeah. The emotional content is really what you want when you're creating sound of any kind. You want to have some kind of an emotional connection. That's what sound does. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean... And, and I've, I've said this multiple times, but if you're watching a movie and you turn off the sound, you know what's going on, but you don't really care about what's going on, <laughs> right? That's a good point. <laughs> like, if you don't want to be scared by a scary movie, turn off the sound. Actually, that makes it a comedy. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it's funny that way. But yeah, definitely, uh, that is something to keep in mind. You know, the sound gives us emotional context. So I feel that that's a really strong part of an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign. Sound shouldn't be the last thing you think about. Absolutely. And unfortunately, it is. And I think that's why your podcast and the message that you put out there is so fascinating, because I have not heard a lot of messaging or insights such as those you share so what I'd really like to talk about now is your ideas about audio branding or what is it, why is it important, and maybe how you weave in storytelling into that as well. Well, as far as audio branding is concerned, I'm going to give you a definition that the International Sound Awards uses. They've been around since 2009. They were based in Germany, actually, so European and Europe, Europe has a bit more going on as far as the sound audio branding is concerned. They've been at it a little longer than we have, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're, we're catching up. <laughs> um, and it is becoming a worldwide phenomenon. So they say that it's a brand sound that represents the identity and values of a brand in a distinctive manner. The audio logo... Branded functional sounds, so like say your GE kettle makes a sound when it's done, mm -hmm. um, or your car does something different than just like the beep beep when you lock it, right? Mm -hmm. If it does something different. Uh, branded functional sounds, brand music, or the brand voice are characteristic elements of audio branding. So it's a bunch of different things. It's an umbrella under which there are a whole bunch of different touch points, I guess, that you would use sound for. So it covers quite a lot. Yeah, it really does. And I think that um, people that think that it's a sonic logo and that's all it is are really making a big mistake because it's way more than just a logo. It's everything you do that's sound related with your brand. Maybe talk a little bit more about why this matters so much. So you think about our experience with everyday objects, like you mentioned mm -hmm like using an electric kettle or your car, some objects or machines in my home, for example, like the, the washer and dryer, I think of both machines, I always turn the sound off mm -hmm. as soon as I start using them. As soon, and I find that sound annoying, mm -hmm. but the sound of my car locking is very reassuring. And I look for that, I, or I should say I listen for that when I walk away from the car. Is that idiosyncratic? Is it simply that I happen to be someone who doesn't like the the chime of my washing machine? Or is it that as people going about our day-to-day -day lives, we want the security of the sound of the car locking, but maybe we don't really appreciate our washer and dryer chiming in the middle of our day? 
I think it depends on what the chime sounds like. So if it has a pleasant sound, then that denotes a more expensive washer and dryer, right? Isn't that psychologically how we think of this, right? So if your dryer makes a sound that's annoying to you, (laughs) that should say something to the manufacturer that maybe they should look at their branded sounds and do a little better. (laughs) Um, But as far as car manufacturers are concerned, that again is psychological kind of leaning towards the opposite way. So you're interested in getting that reassurance that your car is locked, but it doesn't have to sound like your car horn, Mm -hmm. right? Like more expensive cars are going to spend more time figuring out a good sound for that. Less expensive cars hook in that sound into their horn and just leave it and call it a day, right? Mm -hmm. So again, more pleasant sounds give us the impression that whatever it is we're experiencing is a pricier object or uh, a more bespoke object, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think that really manufacturers could stand to understand that a little more and work on it because then they can charge more for their product and it seems like it's worth the money. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Can you give it a good example of a premium brand where the audio brand really resonates with the consumer market or it's made a huge difference in the popularity of the product? Well, Apple, definitely. I mean, any sounds that you hear on Apple are very branded and specific. That's true. And yeah, you get used to them, but they're very pleasant sounds. Now, I'm not necessarily an Apple person myself. I'm more PC and and Android. However, I recognize that that's the case. (laughs) Um, MasterCard has just done a whole rebranding over the last several years. And their product, which is experienced all throughout the world, is now starting to sound more expensive, more inclusive, and more interesting because they're doing things like creating albums. Like they've decided to make a music album with the sounds that they are um, promoting, the brand that they're promoting as far as the sound is concerned for MasterCard. So kind of like what the James Bond films are doing. Mm. They've made a brand that other people are writing to as opposed to someone writing something for their brand and them just tacking it on. Right. Right. So it's a really interesting approach. And I think it makes MasterCard feel more, more relevant, you know, more interesting. It, it actually makes us want to use the product. It has a voice. Yeah, exactly. And it has a very distinct audio brand. And how has that evolved since you began audio branding work and even voiceover work? Have you noticed a lot more interest in nuance and tiny little details that maybe five or 10 years ago weren't as important? Well, I've been doing voiceover for around 15 years, and I've been doing this podcast for around three. And just in those three years, I've heard a lot of difference. Wow. And many more audio branding and music branding companies popping up as well. So originally, the people that I was reaching out to, um, there was Steve Keller, who was working with Pandora and Sirius XM. He's their, their sonic strategy director. And I think Stitcher is one of their, Stitcher and SoundCloud are also ones that they work with. Mm -hmm. So he was doing really interesting things with Studio Resonate, which is their ad agency, and really fascinating types of things. Like uh, when I mentioned that you can influence what you taste by what you hear. That was interesting. That was so interesting. Yeah. So that was from an interview that I did with him where he talked about a promotion they did with a Gatorade-like drink called Propel. And they had DJ stations set up where people could listen to something in their ear, taste the drink, and decide if they wanted it to be salty or sweet. And just by changing the sounds in their ears, they were changing the taste of what they were experiencing. And it, it's just kind of amazing. I know that some beer manufacturers have done this too with people who might want it to be more bitter and less bitter. Hmm. So they, you're listening to a DJ in your ear or some kind of sound and it can dial in the bitterness of the beer. Do you happen to remember the correlation with the sports drink? Was there a certain type of music that made 
podcasters want to hear. Some- I never, I never oh. heard which, like what the okay. actual sound was. <laughs> he didn't reveal that. Um, but yeah, it's, it, there's all sorts of ways that you can play with this. For instance, sustainable food. Uh, and he does a lot of studies as far as like um, the psychological gastronomical stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, he he was mentioning, I think, in our interview that he was experimenting along with other scientists using a certain sound in order to dial in more of a crunch for a particular sustainable food, which I think was squid. Oh, wow. So, hmm. you know, because squid is so plentiful and other types of fish are not... If we were to start having more squid as opposed to, you know, other things. Sure. Then, yeah. So make that crunch part of the attraction versus what some people might initially assume, which is a bit of a squeaky, rubbery sound. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But I mean, also things like being in a hospital and having a diabetic, you know, if they want to experience more sweet in their life, have certain sounds played to them in the hospital. You know, they they can experience more sweet. Okay, I have a sweet tooth, so I need to know what I do. What too. I need to listen to then. I have a sweet <laughs> tusk. I say, yeah, I yes. Think I need to be, uh, steal that from me. Yeah, like, I have the same. It's, it's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, there are all sorts of ways that this can be applied, but I think that uh, healthcare is definitely one of them, and and should be looked into. So if you're craving sweets, what what should you listen to? Oh, I'm not even sure what would influence you as far as that's concerned. Uh, I'm not one of the scientists. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I do like uh, finding out and I, I would love to know, but I tend to find out more about the psychological aspects of this than I do the scientific and, uh, you know, I talk to all sorts of people on the podcast, so it just depends on where their perspective is. Yeah, I have to say some of your guests are just so fascinating, and I don't think I would have come across them otherwise. So thank you for bringing that diversity of thought and opinion and experience. It's I can't recommend it enough, even for people who think that they're not particularly interested in sound or audio branding. You're going to learn something interesting by listening to Jody. So absolutely check it out. Well, thank you. Um, speaking of healthcare, I remember listening to an episode or two episodes that covered a panel of hospital and healthcare sounds. Oh, yeah. And actually, I think you used Clubhouse. Yep, Clubhouse. Yeah. And one of the questions I had, because I've always wondered this, is do we ever really adapt to annoying sounds or do they just become a constant underlying source of stress? Like the beeping hellscape yeah. of a hospital. I think most people understand what that means when they hear that phrase. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Is yeah. that something we can ever really get used to? I think that healthcare needs to change those sounds. If they really want to have effective healthcare, I think they need to change those sounds. Because it is a constant stressor. And yeah, we are trying to tune it out. And it does become white noise after a while. But white noise is stressful. So it doesn't help our efficacy. You know what I mean? It doesn't help our getting better. (laughs) Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And I notice a certain exhaustion that I experience when I'm in a very loud, chaotic environment. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just because I'm an introvert and I'm more sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. But I have to wonder, I think most people are probably sensitive to it on some level, even if they don't realize it. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, For introverts, and I am one of those as well, uh, I think it's a little more extreme for us because we value our peace so much because we need that so much. That's how we recharge. And yeah, for me, I can't even listen to music. I need complete silence. Mm -hmm. That's how I focus. When you really need to focus. Yeah. It needs to be silent. Yeah. 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 Well, that's partly why we moved. We heard sirens and horns and engines and drag racing every hour of the day. We couldn't leave our windows open. So when we moved here and we opened our windows at night, we just heard crickets. Oh, lovely. (laughs) And I felt my whole body start to relax. And I, I don't think that's just a coincidence. I felt like the noise was a major reason why I wanted to leave the city. Um, at the same time, I feel a little bit privileged saying that because I could, you know, not everybody has that choice. 
but it made me think there's a lot of people who are probably suffering undue stress because they're subjected to these constant alarms, even in the city, even outside the hospital. So that episode was fascinating. Um, And also to hear the distinction between alerts versus alarms. Yes. Yeah. 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 There is a big difference. And I think that unfortunately... In the alarm business, there is no difference. They haven't made a difference in the machines. And I I think that that's something that's really detrimental to our health. It is because they end up putting inadvertent noises that are quite abrasive and grating in place of something that could be very innocuous or even relaxing and reassuring. Yeah. And it seems idiosyncratic. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It just, you know, I don't know that all of these companies have a sound design. Oh, they definitely don't. No. And and a lot of these sounds are from the 50s. So this is when computers sounded a certain way, right? Now we have the opportunity to make those sounds much more organic, much more interesting, much more calming. And we didn't have that opportunity for a long, long time. But because the people in the hospital system have gotten so used to hearing those particular sounds, you know, they don't change. Although I think um, Judy, I believe, was the woman who was talking about the work that they're doing with with actually changing those sounds. So, uh, yeah, they are working on it. They're working on new standards, but it is slow going. It is. And it's surprising because sound design and... Sound production seems to have advanced so much more in other parts of our lives. So you've referred a couple of times in your podcast to Christopher Nolan's movies, for example, um, The Shepherd Tone, which creates an audio illusion. And maybe we should actually define that for a moment if you have a definition top of mind. The idea with The Shepherd Tone is that it keeps you tense because the Mm -hmm. music doesn't actually resolve. Right. I think that's right. the idea. I don't know the yeah. actual definition, yeah. but the idea of it is either it's heading downward or it's heading upward, but it never yes. actually resolves. It never resolves. Yeah. It creates a hallucinatory, an audio hallucinatory effect. Yeah. And I think anyone who's seen Christopher Nolan movies like Batman, Inception, those are two good examples. That you can Once you hear the music, you know it's a Christopher Nolan movie. And you've also talked about audio quality in media and and TV and film, I've certainly become one of those people that looks at subtitles. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I do, too. And when you had that episode, I thought, wow, I am so glad that it's not just me. (laughs) No, you're not alone. (laughs) I'm I'm just not hearing. But you had a great point. It's There's a few trends that are coming together to create a bit of a problem for audiences, whether it's that there's a more naturalistic trend in how actors speak, Mm -hmm. and so they're not going to enunciate every little word very clearly. (laughs) And then we have a desire from people like Christopher Nolan to create naturalistic sounds or even interpretive artistic audio that might not be conventionally best practice I would have had it. Yeah. yeah. When it comes to him, I appreciate what he's doing because he is taking that audio and making it a character of its own. It so is. I understand what he's trying to do. The problem becomes that the people who are actually capturing that sound, there's a lot less of them than there are people capturing the visual. So there's maybe like two or three people who are on set with the boom mics figuring out how to get the dialogue. And there's 50 people figuring out the visuals, right? Right. So when you have that kind of a difference in the attention that's paid to actually capturing the dialogue properly, and then combine that with the fact that we're listening to a lot of this on our home studios or on our phone or, you know, in on an iPad or something, I mean... And then the the music kind of gets smooshed together, and then you get this really bad effect of, like, uh, I don't know if you saw the blog that I posted when I did that episode, but if you looked at the blog, there's a video where there's a takeoff of a Christopher Nolan movie with the music on Star Wars. <laughs> So the scene between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, where Darth Vader says he's his father, and and the the 
they did a parody of this as a Chris, Christopher <laughs> Nolan movie, right? You would hear nothing of the dialogue. <laughs> It was really, really funny. I'm going to have to watch that. Yeah, yeah, it was quite something. So, uh, like, I, I understand what he's trying to do. Unfortunately, what's happening is because of this perfect storm of where we're hearing this and how he's creating it, mm-hmm. we're losing the dialogue completely, almost. Like, it's really hard to get the proper dialogue from what you're listening to. I, I, I mean, I saw the new Batman movie. It was good. I, I thought he did a great job with it, but I could barely understand what half the people were saying. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like, okay, I've got to wait for this to come out so I can put the subtitles on. Yeah, um, I mean, it was yeah. it was a good movie, but yeah. I yeah. really like to understand it more. <laughs> Do you think that will change? I'm wondering if there will be a bit of catch up from the audio design end of things where you will have those members on production sets who will have the expertise and the equipment and resources to capture those important nuances and the dialogue critically. You know, I I hope, I really hope that there is, as we get more standards with home studios and more standards with the phones and more standards with the iPads and all of the different places we're hearing this. I mean, streaming media now, I mean, I'm watching everything on my 22-inch screen, right? That's a computer screen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I think it's something that we still have to adjust to, and eventually we will. But I do feel that sound, in some aspects, unfortunately takes the back seat to a lot of the visual. And until we give it the respect that it's due, it's not going to change. Well, I think you're doing some interesting work, and you're making inroads there, especially with your work on Clubhouse, I think you have a weekly chat. Is I that do. Right? Yeah. You do. Mm-hmm. You do. And so one of the elements, of course, there is the audio quality. And you've mentioned how distinctive it is when you can hear somebody who's calling in and they have great equipment versus someone who's just calling in on their phone. Do you think that audio quality will become more important as social media includes more platforms like Clubhouse or or other audio platforms? Will audio quality start to matter more, just like, you know, video has radically improved on our iPhone because people want to take videos and photos of themselves? I think that as far as social audio is concerned, I don't think it should matter. And the reason I say that is because it's it's supposed to be inclusive. And so not everyone is going to have a separate microphone and not everyone is going to have separate headphones or whatever. Uh, Not everyone is going to have that equipment, and our phones are getting better and better for the sound quality. So I don't really think that it will matter because we want that authentic connection. The point of social audio is to make that authentic connection with people speaking to one another, Mm -hmm. to have a discussion, right? I don't want to put any barriers in front of that, and, and I don't think that we should put any barriers in front of that. Authentic connection, whether or not you're using your phone or you're using a mic, I think that it's the authentic connection that's the important part. So I don't want to limit it in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to present yourself as a professional, like, you know, as an audio person, I have to have good equipment because I need to sound good. Of course. But that's because that's part of my brand. That's my audio brand. You know, someone who isn't in the audio industry doesn't necessarily need that kind of equipment. And I don't blame them for not having it. (laughs) Of course. But with the expectation that we will be audio accessible, let's say, do you think there will be more importance placed on voice quality and being able to present with a compelling tone, for example, Um, certainly I I work in corporate communications, so I see the trend of storytelling. It's been alive and well for a while, and there's an audio component to that, but I do see a lot more focus on the visual, the visual aspects of storytelling. But I'm wondering if there will be more attention paid to leaders who can speak in a compelling way using good practices. Do you have a recommended warm-up for audio speaking if you if you have to do a podcast or you have to 
give a presentation, is there a warm-up that you tend to use or go to? I am bad that way. I don't tend to do a lot of warm-ups, <laughs> um, but I do sing a little before I get started. So okay. that helps a lot. Just warming up my voice in general. Uh, and, you know, before I actually do a script when I'm going to do a job, I read that script through. So I speak it aloud. And that, again, is another warm-up. And I may not do that with inflections that I would use if I'm in the session. But, you know, you need to sort of give yourself some muscle memory to understand the script that you're going to perform. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's, that's my warm-up. Where do you see the trends going toward? I think that audio is becoming much more of a part of a brand. And over the years, I've seen that become much more important because people are starting to recognize that in order for a brand to really resonate with the people that experience it, for that no like trust thing to happen, they need to be able to reach their audience in a multi-sensory way. So it's not just one thing. It's not just the visual. It's the audio. It could be a taste. It could be a smell, you know, it, it, all sorts of different things. But using more than one sense is really important. And especially um, especially sound and and smell, if you can do it. Because those are two things that really are tied into our memory. And what's the uh, result? What's the, what's the thing that every advertiser wants? They want you to remember mm-hmm. who, they're, who they're advertising for, right? Instantly, yes. Yeah. yeah. So without that last component to help people remember, it's not going to be a great advertising campaign. So I think it's really super important and people are starting to recognize it a little more. You know, people like Mercedes and MasterCard and uh, Panera Bread and Tostitos and all sorts of really interesting brands are starting to use the sound of their product Mm -hmm. in order to get people more interested and more invested in what they bring to the table as a company. And I think that's going to become more and more important as time passes. And how much do you feel music versus audio branding matters in an experience? People are very familiar with jingles. Yeah. They're usually able to name a few, but I kind of wonder how many other elements of audio branding we're even aware of, if we're even conscious that we're experiencing them or that they're influencing us. Yeah, there are a ton of different places that this could happen. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that really should be in the background. Like, we're we're not actually consciously aware of it, I think, in a lot of cases. I love jingles. I think they should come back because I think that that is a great way for us to remember a brand. But music is not the only thing of an audio brand. It's not separate from an audio brand. An audio brand has a music component to it. So I think music is a part of that. And the brand sounds and every way that you touch your customer or your client or whatever it is you're offering, every way that you touch them should have a sound. But, you know, people don't think about what their on hold sounds like. You know, I I mean, (laughs) isn't that one of the the key things? Like when you're on hold, you are generally kind of annoyed. (laughs) So oh, yes. do you want to hear 80s hairband music if you're calling up a jewelry store? No, you really don't. You want no. to hear something that is part of the brand of that jewelry store. Now, mm-hmm. I mean, they could be edgy. Who knows? Maybe that's their brand. But I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to imagine a jewelry store that 80s hair band music would be the brand. <laughs> I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Maybe there is one out there. I don't know. I want to visit at least. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. But conversely, can you think of any brands, can you name any brands that are really doing audio well? Or maybe they've stepped up their audio game and they've made improvements. Oh, my goodness. There are a lot that I've spoken with people about. Panera Bread is one of the ones that came up um, a Mm -hmm. few times. But, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways that this manifests. And Uh, Car companies, uh, a lot of electric cars, because they can't, they can no longer use the actual physical sound of their engine anymore. So a lot of car companies are changing their sounds to not sound so engine-y because 
Course. Because they're they're not using those sounds anymore. Or if they are, if it's like a Ferrari, you want to hear that sound. But if it's an electric Ferrari, they're going to pipe that sound in. They're not actually using an actual engine. So, Interesting. you know, like a gas burning engine. It's not a, yeah. So yeah. It's in the early days. Certainly, the electric car silence was disconcerting for many people, I think. It was a point of concern. Did the car turn off? Is everything okay? And now it's a differentiator. It's, oh, it's an electric car, so it doesn't make a lot of noise. Isn't that Well, yes, but they actually do have to have some sounds there so that people yeah. are aware of the car outside. Of course. Um, yeah. So they create sounds for these vehicles, right? They, they have to. So mm. they sound like cars. <laughs> That's so funny that we live in an age where we have to create cars that sound like cars because <laughs> they no longer sound like cars. Yeah, um, yeah. The Nissan Leaf actually did a really interesting thing where they made a playlist on uh, Spotify, I think, for people who were using the car to lull their kids to sleep. Because oh. a lot of people would put their kids in the back seat and drive around because the vibrations and the sound of the car would lull them to sleep. And since the Nissan Leaf is, is an electric car, it doesn't have those sounds anymore. So they would they made a Spotify playlist so that parents could still drive their kid around <laughs> and just play that music in the car. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So there's all sorts of innovative ways to think of this. But yeah, the car is becoming an environment where we can do so much sonically. Mm -hmm. And especially when you start to think about, you know, self-driving cars. Like if you're oh, if yes. you're in a self-driving car, what do you do? Uh, you're not driving anymore. You don't have to yeah. pay attention. You don't have to focus. Yeah. Wow. What are you going to do in that car? It is the perfect audio location. It is a it's a, almost soundproof. It's, you know, more soundproof than being outside. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it's a very, like a prime audio environment. And if you're listening to podcasts or you're listening to music or you're playing a game or something like that, audio is going to be super important. So, wow. yeah, a lot yes. of cars are, car manufacturers are starting to think about this very seriously. What do you think? Would you like to do work in that line where you would be able to contribute to that branding? Uh, you know, if they needed a voice, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I do. I love voiceovers and that's, yeah. that's what I love to do. So yeah, if anyone wants a voice, that's definitely what I'm here for. But as far as designing the sound is concerned, that's not really my area of expertise. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Maybe you could be the voice of a certain car. That could be fun. I'm up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of that, what was the most fun or interesting project you've worked on recently or one that stands out? Oh, recently? I just did something for Lint, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was on television for a very short amount of time, but I loved working with them. It's just, I don't get to use the the low sensual voice very much. And that was a lot of fun. So you have a good voice for chocolate. I, I could see that. <laughs> I yes. do enjoy that kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh, that's neat. And of course, when you're practicing, you're you're going over the work in advance, you're thinking about that personality, that how are you going to infuse that tone into what you're reading, what you're performing. Do you ever draw inspiration from characters in film or, or TV? Honestly, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I'm not an animation video game kind of person, so I don't mm -hmm. tend to think in characters. And I came at this from singing rather than acting. So I had to learn the acting part later. Yeah. Which, you know, I definitely had to learn. Uh, and even acting for commercials is acting. Because if I don't believe what I'm saying, no one else is going to believe it. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, I, I better be really... I better yeah. be really excited about what I'm saying or, you know, have a, a different, have a, an actual perspective on things, mm -hmm. you know? That's part of what acting teaches you, to have a perspective. Well, and that's what I'm imagining because you must have work that comes to you occasionally where maybe it's a bit dry, maybe it's a bit stayed, you've done it before, it's not very exciting. 
how do you infuse personality and character into that without it coming across as too character-ish, if, if that makes sense? Well, good acting is never character-ish. If you're talking about commercials, that's, that's mm-hmm. you know, it's different if you're talking about animation and video games. They want, they want a character mm-hmm. there. But for what I do with commercials, really it's all about letting my perspective shine through. And mm-hmm. my perspective when I'm working with a client, any client, they feel that this is really super important and that they're reaching people who maybe are internally in their company. And this is important stuff. And they have an important message to send across. So for me to just acknowledge that it is an important message, then that infuses the importance into the script that may take something that might have been written a little dryly and gives it some personality and gives it some, you know, you might want to pay attention to this. I couldn't agree more. I think it, the audience always comes first as, as a communications professional. That's my first question. Who is the audience and why do they care and what do they need to hear? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's very important. And, and even if it's the driest script ever, I still, it's still important to the people who gave me that script. That's right. And it's it's important to me then. <laughs> so really, that's it's just about it being important. And how you convey that importance of, is, of course, the creative fun of it. It's yes. there's so many ways to, to infuse importance and emotional meaning into what you're reading. It can be a challenge, but it's yeah. a challenge I'm definitely up for. And I, I love corporate narration. I do that all day, every day. That's awesome. Um Maybe we'll pivot for a moment because one of the topics that you have talked about a little bit is self-employment strategies and how outsourcing has saved your life. And I noticed that if I ever try and reach you, you're very, very fast to respond, Jody. And that is a promise that you've made on your website as well. So how has outsourcing saved your life? Well, I don't outsource my email. So there's Impressive. that right now. I was wondering, I had to say, well, yeah. maybe that's, mm, that's her secret. <laughs> yeah. So um, there are some things that I do outsource. I outsource the audio editing of my podcast, definitely, because I don't have time and it's not my expertise. And I know lots of people who it is their expertise. So I'd rather give it to someone where it will take an hour for them to do. And it would take me four hours. Mm. <laughs> It's beautifully done. Yeah. So I I like to hire people who are in their zone of brilliance with the things that I'm hiring them for. So I have someone who does that. I have someone who writes my show notes. Mm -hmm. I have someone who does my social media. And we consult on all of that. I'm part of the discussion when all of this goes on. But having to do all that myself and yeah, it just, I can write. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like pulling teeth for me. So It'll take me four hours and the person I'm hiring, it'll take them a half an hour. (laughs) So I would rather pay someone to do a good job than waste a lot of my time doing stuff that I am not all that brilliant at. Well said. Yeah. So I, I think that people are afraid of hiring someone because they're afraid it'll cost them money before they have money to spend on this. Mm -hmm. And my thought to that is if you spend the money to begin with, you have more time to do what you're really good at. And that is how you make more money, right? Yes. And that's also how you get motivated because you're doing what you actually love. And yes. You're not feeling drained by doing the work that, frankly, makes you unhappy sometimes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a huge stress reliever for my life, having these things taken care of for me. You've also talked a little bit about being an introvert and a business owner and how there's a difference between being shy and being an introvert. I can certainly relate to that. I wouldn't say I'm shy, but I definitely appreciate my alone time. I agree. Talk a little bit about that. You know, as a business owner, how has being an introvert shifted your perspective or or shaped how you do business? Well, the way that it's shaped my business is that it's made me more conscious of my in front of the camera time. And I'm using that in a broader term, so I'm not necessarily saying Zoom or whatever, but like when I'm in front of people. Sure. Yeah. And and my time, as far as that's concerned, I, I limit it. And afterwards, I need time to recover. So 
after this, I will be taking some relaxing time to just watch a show or listen to some nice music or have my dinner <laughs> or, you know, like things that will relax me. And then I wouldn't book anything for at least an hour after just to give myself some time to recover. But I program it in. I actually mm -hmm. put it into my schedule and I schedule in relaxing time. Well, is there anything else you wanted to mention today that we haven't talked about? Oh, my goodness. Social audio is definitely something people should look into, whether it's Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces. I think LinkedIn has their own thing. Fireside. There's all sorts of really interesting ways to connect with people with your voice. What are some of the ways maybe to to get started? So I'll give you an example. For me, I like Clubhouse, mm -hmm. but so many of the events or scheduled talks that they have happen to fall during my working day. So it's not really easy for me to join. Do you have any advice for people who want to use that platform or, or other social audio platforms? Well, first of all, you can probably watch a lot of these things that happen during your workday in the replay. So there's generally a replay on almost anything. A lot of people will start clubs mm -hmm. and they'll have things happen at particular times that work for them. So if you wanted to start a club that had a particular focus, then you could start things from five o'clock on, you know, whenever you want to do that. I just happened to settle on 2 p.m. because it was good for both people on the West Coast and people on the East Coast. And it's actually also good for people in Europe. Um, it's not too late in Europe. Yeah. So, so for me, it was more of a thinking of the global community and how would that work for people. Um, and because I do voiceovers all day, every day, this is my job. Uh, I'm not employed nine to five elsewhere. So, you know, luckily I can set aside that very specific hour and just say, this is what I'm doing for that hour. And, uh, and it's worked really well for over a year now. Mm, well, we'll have to promote that in the show notes for sure. Mm -hmm. Is there an optimal number of audience members or participants for a social audio conversation or presentation? You know, I think 40 or less is probably optimal because anything larger than that and it gets really hard to moderate. I don't like having too many people on stage at one time. But again, like Clubhouse is one of those things where I'm still there, but a lot of people have left. And so when I do a Wednesday room, I'm usually looking at 20 people or less. And that actually works really well because you can make a nice connection with the people who show up. I agree. So, yeah. So for me, I kind of like that. But, you know, it, it really depends on what you're after. Yeah. You mentioned people are leaving. Where are they going to? I'm not convinced they're going anywhere. Honestly, I think that social media as a phenomenon was something that happened during the pandemic because people were at home. They were doing nothing else. So I think that a lot of people have tried to create something. I'm not saying Clubhouse is going to be the be all and end all. That may not be where we end up. But social audio as a thing isn't going away. No, no. And I appreciate that there's no pressure to be on camera. I yes. appreciate, you know, like <laughs> I, I'm like you. I love watching video, silly video to relax, but I do not feel relaxed on video when I know that I'm going to be presented on video. Um, you know, I think a lot of people relate to that. I don't think I'm alone there, but. It, there's something so compelling about social audio where I can speak and ha it, I don't know if this makes sense, but it kind of brings me back to the days where having long phone conversations was the norm. So maybe that's why maybe it's my age and that I, you know, the normal thing for me when I was in high school was to go home and talk to my friends for three hours and until I literally was hoarse. And and so Clubhouse feels very much like that to me, except even better because you can have group conversations. And I just, I wonder if it's it's appealing to me for that reason, but I, I have to think based on what you're saying, Jody, it's more than that. There's something intrinsically connective about audio that allows people to feel like they're closer. There's this, this more intimate space. Yeah, I, I think that that's, correct as far as I'm concerned. 
our voices are very personal things. And when we use our voice to have a conversation, that conversation is personal. And so you're being vulnerable. You are relating to someone in that moment. And it's a connective thing. It's something that brings us together. So I think there's a combo of things there. Yes, it's nice not to have to be on camera. Definitely. I appreciate that. Not having to do ha hair and makeup for an hour. You <laughs> yes. know, like, <laughs> that's, I appreciate that. I think every woman I know <laughs> might appreciate oh, yes. that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's easier. Um, and even if you're there listening, you don't have to be a part of the conversation. You mm -hmm. can actually just stay off the stage and listen to what you're hearing. I find that using it for a way to relate to the people who are listening to my podcast is a really interesting way to use Clubhouse because it gives them a voice if they want a voice, whereas podcasting is a very passive medium. It so is. it's very rare that you're going to hear from anyone in your audience. It just is because people are listening to your podcast for a reason. They're listening on whatever medium they're listening on, and they don't want to be a part of the conversation. They want to be the fly on the wall, right? <laughs> that's that's the point. That's, that's what people are doing. It's a passive medium. Whereas when you're in Clubhouse, you have the chance to not be passive if you don't want to be, and to still be passive if you want to be. So it's less pressure, but it is a way to actually interact with people. Mm -hmm. And and I think I appreciate that a lot more as a podcaster. Because you've been, I mean, you like you mentioned three years, you probably have moments where you wanted engagement, you wanted reciprocity, where yes. you could get a yeah. response. Yeah, it's really hard on a podcast. You know, most people listening are pretty apathetic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't want to participate. They don't want to be asked anything. They don't want to take a survey. They don't want to do any of this stuff that... You know, they don't want to review your podcast. They just want to listen to it. <laughs> Although I must say, I really like your spots with recognition for reviewers. I hadn't heard that on a podcast before. I think I think that's brilliant because people are taking the time to review the podcast. It's a great way to recognize them, make them feel seen. And it it shows that your podcast is clearly quite appealing. And I love it. Yeah, I, I just... I wanted to recognize the people that did take the time because it is one of those things that people have to go out of their way to do. And, you know, the least I can do is acknowledge it. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's, it's great. Well, I'm going to include all the links. I, you've Everything is just beautifully laid out on your website, so I have no problem finding everything that we need. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> it has just been such a pleasure having you on the podcast Maybe I'll leave you with one more question. <laughs> if there's a way to improve social audio, mm -hmm. where would you like to see it go? What would you like to see improve? That's a good question. I think that maybe making it easier for people to use better audio would be a good mm -hmm. way for that to go. So I use a program called Club Deck when I'm on Clubhouse. And that is a, a way for me to be on Clubhouse using my PC. So for me, that is, that's made things exponentially easier for me to be able mm -hmm. to do from my desktop computer. Now, I'm old school, so it may be that that's just me. But any way that you can make it easier for someone to participate and sound better is, I think, going to be appreciated. People like to sound yeah. good. There's no doubt about Definitely. it. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. And I know that uh, Clubhouse is using spatial sound. And there's all sorts of other places that are doing the same. I think also uh, being able to stream to other locations or having ways to record and make other content from what you're doing. Like, mm -hmm. I can record using Club Deck, but it's kind of a workaround. It's, it's not ideal. And I wish that there was a way that Clubhouse made that a little more possible. So that you could use that recording on multiple platforms yeah. without needing a lot of extra work. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Jody. Thank you so much for being our guest on Access Ideas. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. If you love Access Ideas, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and review us on Podchaser via the link in our show notes. 
or wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. Tell your friends about the podcast too. Until next time, thanks for listening to Access Ideas.